Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Rapid Review Series presented by UIMS. My name is Avril Chandel. I am a fourth year medical student at the Second Faculty of Medicine and in this session we will go over some key topics that fall under vascular pathology. Here is the breakdown of the topics um, we will be covering in this lecture. I would just like to point out two things before we begin. One, I am not a trained professional in the field of pathology, just a student um, who has pathology credits. Second, I will just be going over some of the high yield topics that might come up in tests and exams. So use this video as a supplement to your usual study material prescribed by your university. So with that out of the way, let us begin. Um, first, we have a brief overview of vessels. So what are vessels? Vessels are tubes that transport blood throughout our body. Um, they're com uh, composed of three layers. Um, the first layer being intima, which contains the endothelium, subendothelium, and the internal elastic lamina. Media, which contains the smooth muscle cells and um, the external elastic lamina. And then we have adventitia, um, which contains vasa vasorum for um, medium and large sized vessels, um, which is basically like these vessels uh, provide nutrition to the walls of the large and medium sized arteries. And these layers um, vary depending on the function of the vessel. Large vessels are elastic in order to withstand high pressure and propel blood, whereas capillaries have thin walls made of endothelial cells and pericytes to allow for exchange of gas and nutrients. Veins, on the other hand, have thin walls and valves to maintain a low pressure circuit and to prevent backflow respectively. This fundamental difference in structure and function explains why some lesions or diseases affect specific vessels. So let us begin with hypertension, a very common disease that affects one in three adults and is a precursor to many chronic diseases. In essence, hypertension is persistent increased pressure in any vascular bed. According to the American Heart Association, this elevated pressure can be divided up into stages to deal um, with the therapeutic approach, but 140 over 90 would be a safe bet as the cutoff value for hypertension in adults. Hypertension in children is a bit more complicated and 130 over 80 could be considered the cutoff value for children but in a clinical practice, comparative studies with percentile charts must be carried out. So, to deal with hypertension, we have to categorize it and we do it based on etiology and clinical manifestation. Classification based on etiology is primary versus secondary, in which primary hypertension is caused by an idiopathic mechanism which is theorized to be a multifactorial process. One theory suggests that primary hypertension is caused due to age-related deterioration of the medial layer, leading to decreased compliance and higher pressure within the vessel. About 95% of hypertension cases in adults are caused due to primary hypertension, whereas only 15 to 20% of hypertension cases in children are due to primary hypertension, which further supports the early, earlier suggested theory. Um, primary hypertension is also related to some risk factors. We divide them based on modifiable and non-modifiable. Age, ethnicity, and positive family history are non-modifiable risk factors, whereas obesity, diet, smoking and stress are modifiable risk factors. Then we have secondary hypertension, which is caused by a known condition. Common conditions that cause secondary hypertension can be remembered by the mnemonic recent, 
in which R stands for renal diseases like renal artery stenosis, E stands for endocrine diseases like Cushing's syndrome, C stands for coaptation of iota, E stands for estrogen pills, which are oral contraceptives in women, N stands for neurological etiologies like raised intracranial pressure and psychostimulant use, and T stands for treatment like good, uh, glutagocorticoids or NSAIDs. Risk factors are based on etiology itself. And then we classify hypertension based on its clinical manifestation um, and which are known as benign versus malignant. So a BP between 140 over 100 and 180 over 120 would be considered benign and have a clinically silent course, reducing chronic disease like ischemic heart disease or in turn lead to malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension, on the other hand, is a BP over 180 over 120 and is a medical emergency which needs to be treated immediately. It causes acute and organ damage like retinopathy and renal failure. So we've seen hypertension is increased pressure within the vessel. This pressure is exerted onto the lumen of the vessel and may cause or accelerate a process called arteriosclerosis. So what is arteriosclerosis? Arteriosclerosis is the hardening of arteries due to thickening of the vessel wall. This thickening causes the lumen to narrow leading to reduced blood being supplied to areas after the obstruction. We have three types of arteriosclerosis. One in small arteries which is called arteriolosclerosis. One in large or medium arteries which is called atherosclerosis. And then we have Monkeberg's medial uh, calcification which is clinically insignificant. Um, it causes calcified lesions in the media which do not obstruct the blood flow. Thus, they are clinically insignificant. So let's begin with arteriolosclerosis, which affects the small vessels. It's broadly divided between hyalin and hypoplastic. Hyalin arteriosclerosis causes is caused by long-standing benign hypertension or diabetes, which causes proteins from the serum to leak into the vessel wall, causing it to have a pink hyaline-like appearance under the microscope. Um, whereas the consequence of it would be chronic damage to the organs. This damage is, can be seen as glomerular scarring, which would progress to chronic renal failure if left untreated. We also have hyperplastic arteriosclerosis, which is caused due to malignant hypertension. This stress causes hyperplasia of smooth muscle cells within the wall of the vessel. And this appears as onion skin when we see it under the microscope. And you can see it also in the picture on the uh, right top hand side. And what hyperplastic arteriosclerosis does is it leads to fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall, um, which would also be accompanied by hemorrhage. And this is seen very often in kidneys and they would have acute renal failure with flea bitten appearance, which is classical for um, hyperplastic arteriosclerosis or malignant hypertension. Next, we have atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is characterized by internal plaques called atheromas, which impinge on the vascular surface, disrupting the hemodynamics of the blood. These atheromas um, are basically plaques uh, composed of soft fibril lipid cores, uh, mainly consisting of cholesterol and their esters, along with some necrotic debris. And all of that is covered by a fibrous cap. Um, risk factors for atherosclerosis 
um, can also be divided into modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, smoking and diabetes are modifiable risk factors, whereas age, gender and genetics are non-modifiable risk factors for atherosclerosis. So how are these arthromas formed? One way to explain this is the response to injury hypotheses, um, which is divided in approximately five steps. Um, in the first step, <coughs> we have endothelial damage that allows LDL to leak into tunica intima. LDL is low density lipoprotein. Um, and this can be further accelerated with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, toxic um, substances from cigarette smoke, homocystinemia, or just hemodynamic disturbances. Um, in step two, we have LDL um, and cholesterol being oxidized within the tunica intima. In step three, this dysfunctional endothelium expresses receptors for diabetes and migration of monocytes into tunica intima. And these monocytes are then activated to macrophages, which consume the oxidized LDL via scavenger receptors to form foamy cells. And these, accumula uh, these accumulate to form a fatty streak. Fatty streak uh, is a precursor lesion to arthromas. In step four, um, foamy cells would produce pro-inflammatory cytokines that initiate the chronic inflammatory uh, response in which T cells are recruited to the site of the inflammation and produce interferon gamma, which activate the macrophages to cause necrosis. And in the last step, uh, step five, growth factors are also released by macrophages, which lead to proliferation of smooth muscle cells, um, which form the fibromuscular cap. They also lay down collagen type one to further support that. And this fibromuscular cap may go undergo um, dystrophic changes over time um, and uh, become calcified. So once the arthroma is formed, um, it's irreversible injury and what these arthromas do is they um, have a lot of complications is what they do. Um, and these complications account for more than 50% of diseases in the Western world. Um, as you can see, they might produce stenosis of medium sized vessels leading to impaired blood flow and ischemia causing peripheral vascular disease um, due to atherosclerosis of uh, popliteal uh, artery, as I mentioned earlier, um, causing angina uh, due to atherosclerosis of coronary arteries, or ischemic bowel disease due to atherosclerosis of mesenteric arteries or the abdominal artery. Um, they might also call rupture with thrombosis, uh, which would result in a myocardial infarction or stroke. Um, then there can also be a plaque rupture with embolization resulting in um, atherosclerotic emboli characterized by cholesterol crystals. And we also have weakening of vessel wall resulting in aneurysm. Uh, ischemic heart disease is probably the most common and fatal consequence of atherosclerosis. Um, it is an umbrella term for several diseases and syndromes that are caused due to an imbalance between the oxygen perfusion and the metabolic demand of cardiomyocytes. Cardiomyocytes primarily use oxidative phosphorylation to produce energy. Thus, they are highly dependent on the O2 supply. So if this supply is disrupted for less than 20 minutes, it causes a reversible injury called angina. And if this disruption is for more than 20 minutes, then it causes an irreversible injury called myocardial infarction. So what is angina? Angina can be regarded as a type of myocardial ischemia. 
Um, clinically, it's referred to as chest pain due to exertion or stress. It represents reversible injury of the cardiomyocytes and it has no necrosis. It, it has subendocardial ischemia and the EKG would show uh, an ST segment depression. An angina would always be relieved by um, administration of nitroglycerin. We can divide angina into um, two categories as stable and unstable. Stable um, angina is due to atherosclerosis of coronary arteries with more than 70% stenosis. Um, and this becomes really significant or apparent during exertion like exercising and stable angina would also be relieved if the stress is taken away. Whereas unstable angina is due to rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque with thrombosis and incomplete occlusion of the coronary artery. Thus, even at rest, there would be ischemia and if you take away some kind of stress from the person, this angina would not be relieved. Um, and that is the main difference between stable and unstable angina. There is also um, another kind of angina called Prince Metals angina, which is an episodic chest pain unrelated to exertion. It's a type of vasospasm which may be caused due to cocaine, caffeine, or tobacco consumption, and it causes transmural ischemia. Next, we have the myocardial infarction, which is basically the complete occlusion of a coronary artery, and it's mostly caused by a rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque, which causes a uh, thrombosis. It represents irreversible injury of cardiomyocytes leading to necrosis. And most commonly it happens in the left anterior descending branch, um, which is almost 50% of the cases. Then um, on second place, we have the right coronary artery, which accounts for about 35% of cases. And then we have the left circumflex artery accounting for about 15% of the cases. And in the image, we can also see the um, walls and the structures they affect. And this is quite important as this would be seen in an EKG. So the question is, what would a patient look like? The patient would have a severe crushing chest pain for more than about 20 minutes. That pain may radiate to their left arm or jaw. They would be sweating profusely. They would have dyspnea. And the pain, most importantly, would not be relieved by nitroglycerin. Um, if you conduct EKG studies on them, um, these EKG studies can be broadly categorized as um, ST elevated um, and non-ST segment elevated. Um, in non-ST segment elevation or NSTEMI, we see there is subendocardial infarction where less than 50% of the wall is involved. And in STEMI or ST segment elevated, um, we would see that there's transmural infarction where the 100% of the wall is involved. If we do lab studies, um, troponin I would be recommended. Um, it is the gold standard for myocardial infarction as the levels rise two to four hours after the infarction, peak at 24 hours and return to normal seven to 10 days in. We have CKMB, which is creatinine kinase. It is uh, useful for detecting reinfarctions that occur days after the initial attack. Creatinine kinase um, levels rise about four to six hours after the infarction, peak at 24 hours and return to normal by 72 hours. And last but not least, we have myoglobin. It is less specific and sensitive as it may be elevated in disease of 
musculoskeletal system, but it may still have some usefulness in detection of reinfarctions. In pathology, it's also very important to look at the morphological changes during a myocardial infarction. So in less than four hours, we see no microscopic or gross changes, but there are complications that might occur in this time period, like congestive heart failure, where the myocard is not able to pump adequate cardiac output due to decreased source of energy, or arrhythmia, damage to the conducting system of the heart may cause fatal arrhythmias causing sudden death. In the four to 24 hour period, the myocardium undergoes coagulative necrosis, which appears as dark discoloration grossly. It would show hallmarks of coagulative necrosis like preserved structure, increased eosinophilia and lack of nuclei. And in this time period, arrhythmias are the major complication um, that can happen. In one to three days, Acute inflammation starts to occur with infiltration of neutrophils. Influx of leukocytes also um, comes to this area causing a yellow discoloration. Um, <clears throat> in this period, fibrinous pericarditis is very common, which basically is due to transmural infarction leading to spread of the inflammatory process into the epicardium and then causing inflammation there as well. Um, in the four to seven days period, macrophages are recruited after the neutrophils to clear the necrotic debris and start the healing process. On gross in inspection, um, there might be a yellowish or white pallor, depending on um, which book you're reading. And the action of neutrophils and macrophages may weaken the surrounding tissues, causing them to rupture. And that's the reason why ruptures are a very common complication during this period, rupture of the free ventricular wall, um, that may lead to cardiac tamponade, intraventricular septum, or papillary muscles. Next, we have the one to three week period. Um, this period is after the necrotic debris is cleared and the healing process causes pl uh, proliferation of fibroblasts, myelofibroblasts, collagen type three, capillaries and endothelium called degranulation tissue. It has a red appearance due to the fresh blood supply. Um, and in this period, not many complications occur other than the ones that I've mentioned before already. And in months after um, the myocardial infarction, this damaged tissue will undergo remodeling to form fibrous scars. Um, they're white fibrous scars composed of dense fibrous connective tissue. Um, although it is, um, um, you know, dense fibrous connective tissue, it is much weaker than the original um, material of the wall. Thus, aneurysms um, become quite a common complication during this period. And Dressler syndrome is an autoimmune reaction where due to the previous pericarditis that we saw earlier, antigens against the pericardium are produced, causing fibrinous pericarditis. Now, let's talk about vasculitis. Vasculitis is a general term for vessel wall inflammation. The two most common pathogenic mechanisms of vasculitis are immune-mediated inflammation and direct vascular invasion by infectious pathogens. Examples of uh, infectious diseases um, is shown here on the slide, like the appropriate rash um, seen with um, septicemia of meningococcus. And then we have non-infectious or immune-mediated um, diseases, which we can further subdivide 
um, as large, medium, and small vessel diseases. So based on the vessels they primarily affect. Now to tap tackle this topic, I've condensed most of the information into tables, which will help you to um, highlight the key differences of the variety of diseases that fall under this topic. I hope that it's helpful. First, we have large vessel vasculitis, which consists of temporal arteritis and Takayasu arteritis. Um, temporal arteritis is a form of chronic granulomatous uh, vasculitis that classically involves the branches of the carotid artery. It is the most common form of vasculitis among older adults in developed countries. It presents in elderly females as headache, visual disturbances, and jaw claudications. Um, Flu-like symptoms are also common with joint and muscle pain. Um, you would normally see um, they might have a elevated ESR and the diagnosis depends on the biopsy and histology um, of the biopsy. However, the vascular inflammation is segmental and a negative biopsy does not exclude the diagnosis. Whereas Takayasu's arteritis is also a granulomatous uh, vasculitis of branches of the aortic arch and is characterized principally by ocular disturbances and marked uh, weakening of the pulses in the upper extremities. That's also why it's often referred to as pulseless disease. And it normally presents in young Asian females. Both of these diseases are um, treated by corticosteroids. Next, we talk about medium vessel vasculitis, which is comprised of polyarteritis nodosa, Kawasaki's disease, and thromboangitis obliterans, or Burgess disease. Um, polyarteritis nodosa is a necrotizing vasculitis which involves multiple organs, but classically spares the lungs. Um, it presents in young adults as hypertension, due to its renal artery involvement, abdominal pain with melena due to uh, its mesenteric artery involvement, and neurological disturbances and skin lesions. It's often associated with serum um, um, HVSAG, which is related to hepatitis B, um, and lesions of varying stages are present. Early lesions consist of transmural inflammation with fibrinoid necrosis. Eventually, they heal with fibrosis, producing uh, a classical image of string of pearls appearance on imaging. Next, we have the Kawasaki's disease. Um, classically affects Asian children below the age of four. Uh, presents with nonspecific signs um, which can be remembered as the mnemonic crash and burn, um, C for conjunctivitis, R for rash, A for adenopathy, S for strawberry tongue, um, H for hands and feet, um, rash and burn, which is fever. And as these are the most common symptoms, crash and burn is the perfect mnemonic for it. Um, Coronary artery involvement is common and leads to risk for uh, thrombosis with myocardial infarction and aneurysms, um, which may rupture. Um, whereas the last um, disease we have is Burgess disease, which is a necrotizing vasculitis involving digits. It is prim uh, primarily due to um, disruption in tibial and artery, uh, radial arteries uh, caused due to an immune reaction to tobacco extracts. Thus, um, session of smoking is the best um, treatment for this disease. Lastly, we talk about small vessel vasculitis in which I'm going to highlight four very important diseases. 
first we have venous granulomatosis, which is necro which is a necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis involving the nasopharynx, lungs, and kidneys. Classically, it presents in middle-aged male with sinusitis and nasopharyngeal ulcerations, hemoptysis with bilateral nodular lung infiltrates, and hematuria due to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Um, the <clears throat> disease also correlates with the serum C anchor levels, and biopsy reveals large necrotizing granulomas with um, ne necrotizing vasculitis. Treatment is cyclophosphamide with steroids, and relapse is unfortunately common in the uh, in this condition. Next, we have the microscopic polyangitis, which is a necrotizing vasculitis involving multiple organs, and they especially affect the lung and kidneys. They present very similarly to uh, Wegner's granulomatosis, but nasopharyngeal involvement and granulomas are absent. Um, the disease activity also correlates with the serum P anchor, and the treatment of this uh, uh, condition is corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide. Um, in Chirk Strauss syndrome, uh, we see necrotizing granulomatous inflammation with eosinophils involving multiple organs, especially lungs and heart. It is a rather um, rare disorder, only affecting one in one million individuals. And um, we often see it with asthma and peripheral uh, eosinophilia. It's also um, correlated with the serum P anchor levels and it's treated by glu uh, glucocorticoids uh, plus minus cyclophosphamide. Last but not the least, um, Henox choline purpura is, is a vasculitis due to IgA immune complex depositions. Um, it is the most common vasculitis in children. It presents with palpable purpura on their buttocks or leg, um, gastrointestinal pain and bleeding with hematuria due to IgA nephropathy, which is called Berger's disease. Usually it occurs following um, a viral infection in the upper respiratory tract and the disease is rather self-limited. So that is all for our um, arterial diseases now and we will move on to our venous diseases. So let's kick off venous diseases with deep vein thrombosis. Um, it is a thrombosis originating from the deep veins of the lower extremities. Um, as we can see on the right, um, this thrombosis is caused due to venous stasis, hypocoagulability, or endothelial damage. These three together are also known as virtuose triad. Um, and the life cycle of this thrombus um, would be that if it's non-occlusive, it would get lysed. And if it's occlusive, it might go unnoticed. It might um, cause sudden death or generally it might cause <clears throat> swelling and tenderness of calf muscles. Um, and nowadays the incidence is reduced due to um, administration of subcutaneous low-dose heparin and early mobilization of patients after operation as trauma and surgery is one of the top risk factors for this disease. Um, other risk factors include immobilization like on long flights, heart failure, old age, obesity, pregnancy, um, and most importantly, contraceptive pills for females, which is very common. Last topic of the day today is varicose veins. Varicose veins are dilated and long veins produced due to venous hypertension. It's uncertain if this dilation is produced due to the failure of valves or vice versa. Um, but it's very commonly seen in um, the elderly population. About 10% of adults have um, varicose veins on their legs. Um, 
hemorrhoids are another example of varicose veins um, seen in the pelvis or abdomen. And esophageal varices um, are a common complication seen due to portal hypertension. Um, and bleeding um, due to these esophageal varices um, can lead to death and is very often seen in patients with cirrhosis. So that's all folks. I hope this lecture has provided you with sufficient aid for your exams. If you made it through the entire lecture, please do not forget to review the lecture with the help of the QR code. It would help improve the quality of these lectures. Good luck for your exams. Thank you and goodbye.